Brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. How did we get to a place where baptisms are performed invalidly on what sadly appears to be a fairly routine basis? How did we get to a place where Rome ignores those events while decrying rigidity among priests, working to prevent priests from embracing traditional Catholicism? All the while Rome denounces what they call clericalism and the hierarchical nature of the church. The state of the church seems too ridiculous to be believed, and I have for you today a story where one of the great villains of our time gives us an explanation of what it is that the modernists actually want, a leveling of the church. And I'm going to link this for you to the invalid baptism story because inside the church those are incredibly important stories for our time. As for everything else in the world going on right now, please pray. Let's get into this. I think a good way to frame this story is with some obvious heresy from Pastor Jimmy Martin of the Jesuit Church. Pastor Jimmy never misses an opportunity to preach heresy if that heresy satisfies the values of the world. And he recently tweeted some absolute nonsense that really frames what we're talking about here because traditional Catholics have a healthy understanding of the hierarchy of the church and would like a little more of that rigidity that Francis and his friends refer to as clericalism. Pastor Jimmy thinks this is a danger to the faith and helps us understand what the modernists want with their so-called reforms. He tweeted out something written by a moral theologian who was a Jesuit named Father James Keenan, who teaches at Boston College. Here's the great danger of the faith in the eyes of the modernists, meaning a danger to modernism and their ill-begotten reforms of the council. Quote, for the past 20 years, clericalism has been a helpful concept to identify the problematic culture within the clergy that is sorely in need of reform. In fact, it has served to focus matters needing reform, not only concerning the Ted McCarrick type priests and the mess they made, but also a wide array of other matters. Still, though, reformers insist that clericalism embraces the entire clergy, from priests to bishops. They inevitably, singularly default to reform of the priesthood. This article insists that now, nearly 40 years after the Ted McCarrick type priest mess first broke, we must redirect our focus primarily onto the father of clericalism, quote-unquote hierarchicalism, a much more distinctive, protected, and powerful culture that has generated many of the contemporary problems in the church that compromise her mission, end quote. What is hierarchicalism? Well, first, as far as I can tell, it's not actually a word, and the Jesuit he's quoting probably came up with that word because that's what academics do. They make up words and then expect you'll understand what they mean when they just use them willy-nilly. But I can define it for you, not by putting words into the author's mouth, but by quoting an article from, written by a fellow modernist, a fellow traveler to the Jesuit in question. And that writer is actually talking about something else that Father James Keenan wrote, that same Jesuit that we were talking about here. It's pretty convenient, actually. On the question of hierarchicalism, a few years ago, the National Catholic Reporter published an article talking about the problems of the hierarchy in the church. There they write, quote, Hierarchy and vulnerability are seemingly incompatible ideas. Hierarchy in the Catholic imagination signals status, power, privilege, and the ability to control. Vulnerability, on the other hand, signals weakness, a flaw of some sort. It is to be avoided. But vulnerability, properly understood, is precisely what members of the Roman Catholic hierarchy need to embrace as a strength, argues Father James Keenan, a Jesuit theologian. If it is ever to understand an essential interior element at the core of our humanity, the absence of which lies at the core of the Ted McCarrick type priest mess, the hierarchy must develop a culture of vulnerability. End quote. He then quotes Keenan directly to get a definition, which you should remember is to argue that creating a culture of vulnerability in the priesthood is how we prevent future Ted McCarrick type priests from wreaking havoc in the church. Bear that in mind. Quote, Hierarchicalism is that culture precisely at the center of the more recent Ted McCarrick type priest problem. The hierarchical culture has greater power and greater networking capabilities than clerical culture. We need then to distinguish the two, not because clericalism is not pernicious, it is, but because we have to understand better the viciousness of the culture, more isolated and protected than the clergy's and more certainly complex, insidious and driven than we know or acknowledge. End quote. There's a funny thing about this. These guys never mention the problem that, according to all the research, there's a near-perfect correlation between the priests being part of, shall we say, the group that Pastor Jimmy Martin notoriously spends his time being a voice for, and the priests who engage in the evil deeds that Ted McCarrick did. It's a near-perfect correlation, and that, by the way, is not a coincidence. 
Instead, they blame the priesthood itself because what they call clericalism and hierarchicalism is the nature of the priesthood itself and of the episcopate. Those things are by definition holy and set apart. And because they are holy, the typical good or even mediocre priest is something different than the rest of us. They are supposed to be, by definition, because they are touched by a kind of grace that the rest of us simply are not. And they are to be treated differently as a consequence. It is why, in better times, people wouldn't treat priests like their buddies, but would instead treat them with a kind of holy deference. It is up to each priest to be worthy of such treatment, and as sinners, many of them just simply fail to do so. But they can consecrate the bread and wine. They can forgive sins. And because of those things, they are to be treated with the deference they deserve. Our forebears in the faith understood this, but the modernists seek only one thing to level the church in the name of the false gospel of secular equality. That is why the focus of so much of the hierarchy and clericalism is on the hierarchy and clericalism, and they completely ignore the people Pastor Jimmy Martin has a rather unhealthy interest in. What they want is democracy in the church. It is why the lay faithful are front and center in the synod of synodality, and it is why non-Catholics are actively participating in the synod and helping Catholics to find what our faith is supposed to be, which is just bizarre to think about. And it's how we get messes like priests invalidly baptizing people, saying, we baptize you instead of following the church's explicit instructions on how to confer a valid sacrament. Monsignor Charles Pope wrote about this recently for the National Catholic Register, and it's directly connected to this attack on clericalism. In his article, which was published by the National Catholic Register, no, you know, rad trad online outlet by any stretch of the imagination, Monsignor Pope begins by talking about the situation in Phoenix with invalid baptisms and points out that the priest is contrite and that he should not be attacked for his error since he is apparently making amends. And then he goes on to explain how this happened. Pay attention. Quote, Where did the priest in Phoenix get the idea to say we instead of I in the baptismal rite? Most often, these ideas emerge in the often strange world of liturgical publications and conferences, where priests, liturgists, and other authors dream up strange ideas, like putting sand in the holy water font, or washing hands instead of feet on Holy Thursday, or replacing the priestly incessation of the altar with the dancers holding smoke pots. It is often a world where imaginations run wild and proper theology gives way to excessive creativity. Articles are published in liturgical modifications that are dubious at best and erroneous at worst, and they insinuate themselves into parishes. Large Catholic gatherings like the Los Angeles Religious Education Conference often put these innovations on wide public display, and they spread even further. In this case, certain liturgists have wanted to emphasize that the entire community baptizes the child, not just the priest. Their goal is to level the church and remove the hierarchical distinctions between clergy and laity. End quote. Erasing these distinctions has been a goal of the modernists for some time. Some openly talk about a hopeful future where there are no priests anymore, and the sacraments are confected by the peers of the worship space community, and that the hierarchy is, by extension, of course, erased. No more bishops, no more popes, unless, of course, they're, they're you know, selected by the people of the church itself. Some openly say these things. And I'll be the first to tell you that despite being so on paper, anyone who advocates for that stuff is not of the same faith as us. Not in the slightest. We are to respect our priests and the hierarchical nature of the church. That does not mean submitting to their errors. Never submitting to their errors, and it does not mean respecting open heretics. Our troubles happen in our time when a combination of heresy and disregard for the nature of the church is used by those in the hierarchy themselves. Francis is a great example of this. He preaches his synodal vision of the church, which is a democratization of the faith, a weakening of the hierarchy, while simultaneously smashing tradition and engaging in misuses of his authority to achieve the goals of the modernists, which has to be the very definition of the clericalism that he himself decries constantly. The liturgy is essential to understanding this. Monsignor Charles Pope continues to explain the problems in this attempt to erase the hierarchy. Quote, what is the wider mentality that gives rise to these sorts of problems? The sacred liturgy is not a plaything. It's not a script for us to adapt or stage on which we engage in self-actualization. The rubrics and sacred texts are not a mere template for our creative additions. Too often today there is a mentality that is exactly the opposite of these truths. Instead of being formed by the liturgy, we seek to form and mold it to our modern preferences and thinking. Mystery and ancient truths are off-putting to certain modern people. Many want all things to be approachable, understandable, and quote-unquote welcoming. Too many do not want to be obedient to norms. They just want creativity, 
These sorts of attitudes give rise to innumerable errors and disobedience in the liturgy. While the priest in Phoenix may not have been intentionally defiant, he and others have been misled by those who are often cavalier and defiant. Too many think they can improve on the liturgy and sacred texts, but the sacred texts are carefully crafted to reflect the teachings of the church and to reflect the truth. Many of these texts are the product of centuries of reflection. The Roman collects are a special treasure, tersely and carefully constructed to reflect sacred realities. We should study them, not toy with them. End quote. You know, I kind of wish Monsignor Charles Pope had been around during and after the council to remind people of this reality and this truth that he just told us, that the liturgy is not a plaything. Maybe we wouldn't have the new Mass if more priests had been like him in those days. The modernists are scrapping tradition as quickly as they can, and it's obvious. They're only slowed by the institutions of the Church, including canon law and the various constitutions of the various groups they want to suppress, but they are seeking a workaround. I mean, we know that. And I want to close this on a note from St. Thomas Aquinas, who must have been prescient about the threat posed by their modernists, because what he says here is eerie. Quote, It is absurd and a detestable shame that we should suffer those traditions to be changed, which we have received from the fathers of old. End quote. Yes, St. Thomas is absolutely correct. The attempt to bury tradition is a detestable shame, one we do not have to put up with, especially in these times when the world appears to be spiraling towards a fulfillment of the Akita prophecy, which states that fire will fall from the sky. Keep praying these times and do not let the modernists distract you or fool you into thinking that they are finished with their attempts to remake the church into the image and likeness of their father below. What did you think of this story? Is Monsignor Charles Pope correct about the consequences of this leveling of the church and the consequences this has for the sacramental life? And is he correct about not tinkering with the sacred liturgy? Let me know in the comments, please. And in this season of Lent, especially given everything going on right now, please remember to offer your Lenten sufferings and penances for the sanctity and liberation of, and exaltation of the church. This is the only way that the world will return to holiness and to God. Please pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.